Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So the first thing we're going to take a look at today, looking at working with managing assignments and strategies for assignments, is just a quick little suggestion. When you're going to tinker with assignments, we usually recommend that you make a copy of an existing course that you teach with so that you can experiment and make changes without affecting anything that's live. And of course, your experience with that already, Mary, um, you know, if you want to make some changes, it's probably a good idea not to do it where students are going to be working, right? Mm -hmm. Personal experience, yeah. I did that already. <laughs> so our first thing we're going to look at on our agenda today are some creative ways to enhance your assignments. So we're going to start off here by walking through and creating a homework assignment and including a couple special features. So again, don't hesitate to ask questions as we are working through this. So in a homework assignment, you're familiar already with, for example, let's assume this was graphing. Um, I know you said you teach a lot of, you know, college algebra, dev math, so you're very familiar with this kind of material. So let's assume we were graphing linear equations. And you're already familiar with choosing questions and adding them to your assignment, like this. You can sort by objective as well. So let's add an application problem there. Um, but a couple other things that sometimes faculty are not aware of or they're not quite sure how to use. And one of them would be using existing media for that assignment. Have you used media in your assignments at all? Uh, no, I haven't done that. Okay, so here's a really nice tool. When you click on this chapter, you notice you also have a media option here. And if you drill down then to, of course, section two, which is where we're working with graphing linear equations, you will see that you have some media to choose from for this particular assignment. Up on the right-hand side, you can see media types. So you do occasionally, depending upon the book or the chapter or resources, you would have animations. You have some chapter test prep videos. You can include a PowerPoint for students to use, a section lecture videos, textbook. If you're teaching, um, for example, if you would teach a statistics course or if you would teach some of the interactive figures courses, um, some of the pre-cal college algebra and calculus has interactive figures. You may have seen those. Those will also show up here. In addition, you can add your own media, which is a really nice tool if you or some colleagues have made some videos on Camtasia, for example, that you'd like to include. So let's say we wanted to have our students be able to work through an animation about graphing linear equations. All we need to do is check the box and add it. And then, of course, you know that you could click sort if you wanted to have the media show up first in the assignment. Um, what's really nice is that you might even have two animations or two particular videos you'd like students to see. For example, a lot of times you'll see objective one, objective two, you'll see some mini videos. So let's assume we'd like our students to see that before they start the first homework. And then objective two is, you know, graphing a linear equation by finding and plotting. And so let's say that we would like students to see that before they started problems four and five. We can even parse the homework assignments with media so that it falls in an order that's a logical progression for students. What do you think of that? Does it look like a tool that you might find helpful? Yeah, I think that's really neat. Uh, just a question, um, are these the same media that students can get in the multimedia library or are these different? A lot of the media that are here are also in your multimedia library. In addition, you might see, for example, objective videos here that may show up more as chapter videos or section videos in the library. So sometimes some of the media is broken down into some additional pieces. And again, remember here you can also add your own media. So you do have a little bit maybe more adaptability here. But this is a really great way to take those resources in the multimedia library and make sure that students see the ones that you really want them to use. And again, here you can add your own. You can add an animation, audio. If you want to even just add a handout for students to use, you can do that here. You can link to a video or a website. The other part that's nice is that you can then associate it with the chapter and section and even objective that you're working on so that your students have no problem figuring out what it is that you're using for media. Any other okay. questions for that? No, I just see they get points for the media questions, too, just like the other, um, the regular questions. 
Right. Those are great. Right. So that's the next thing you're going to take a look at. Um, you know, you have some scoring options and things that you can do in a particular problem because, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is that a student might just, for example, click a media, watch it, you know, for literally a second and then close it and they got a point for that. So there's a couple things you can do. Number one, if you go back to your section, sometimes you'll have video check questions. Um, they'll be coded as VC or you may have um, questions that even have a video embedded in them. So you can see here, for example, if we preview this question, this one has a video directly embedded in the problem and then it asks them a question. So they're going to have to watch that video and answer that question to get a point, not just click on the video and then close it. So that's a really good way to kind of get around that whole option of a student getting a point for not really using the media like we'd like them to. So you could add those into your assignment and you could remove objective videos or you could keep these as homework questions, whichever one you would like to do. The other thing you can do is change the point value over here as well. So for media questions, I like to give them a point for, you know, having watched the video and answered a question. But for example, maybe when they get to an application problem, I might make that one worth more points. So you can easily go over here and change the point value for the problem. Now again, if you're familiar with these little metrics that show up when you look at a problem, you'll see that the level of difficulty is indicated for you, like how students have performed on this in the past. So if you do find that you would like to give students some more points on certain questions, I often use these as a guide, like the harder the question, the more points it might be worth. Okay, I do like that. And then of course you'll see that the points are tallied for you, so even though there might be eight questions in some media, this particular homework assignment is now worth 15 points. One other thing that you can do too here is modify learning aids, and this is really cool. So you can actually at the course level, like your school, you said you had a course that you could copy, for example, from a coordinator course. You may have already had an, a learning aid removed at the entire course level, like sometimes certain schools want to not have students have the, you know, an example, they want students to have a help me solve it. Regardless of whether that was made, we can focus on modifying learning aids at the assignment level. So let's expand the screen a little bit. So you'll notice above the assignment, I clicked View Question Details. And now you see, again, your assignment's listed in here. But you can come in here and take a look at, you know, the estimated time it's going to take students. You could change numeric answer tolerance. This is something that's probably more meaningful, for example, in some of the higher level courses or something like statistics. You can actually give credit for unsimplified answers. So this is a really powerful tool for dev math. A lot of times, you know, students work through the problem, but then they forgot to reduce their fraction, for example. So you can actually give them some credit for having done the correct computation, even though they did not finish the simplification at the end of the problem. You can also limit the number of tries within each question. So in a lot of courses, if you just adopted a course from my math lab or in the template course that you're working with, students might have unlimited number of attempts. So you might want to change that. You might want to say, well, I'm going to give you two attempts inside this question or three attempts inside this question to get the answer right. And of course, you can have students show work. The part we really want to look at is this learning aid part. So on a particular problem, you're familiar with the learning aids that students have. I'm just going to click on number one here and take a look at this. So on a typical problem, they're going to have help me solve it, you an example. There might be a video available or an animation. And of course, my textbook and my instructor, and you could provide an instructor tip. But you can actually, to the question level or the assignment level, make changes to this. So here we are looking at number one, and we could say, well, on number one, I'm not going to let you view an example, but I will let you have a help me solve this. Or perhaps number one, is a problem where I want you to have all of those features, but on number two, I would like you to try to solve the problem without learning aids, and you could remove learning aids for the second problem if they're very similar problems, for example. Sometimes on my word problems, I'll give them two word problems, and there'll be one that has all the learning aids, and the next one won't have learning aids, so that they kind of have to start to wean off of those learning aids a little bit. I do like that. That's a good idea. It's a really nice feature. You can also do it at the assignment level. So for example, if you do have maybe two smaller assignments on a particular topic, sometimes we, you know, faculty will choose to say the first assignment you're going to have learning aids, 
the second assignment, the second 10 questions, you're not going to have learning aids at all. So that you can also do it at the assignment level. Whatever changes you make on this page, you then simply click OK, and you can go back to the assignment that you were working on. So you would change those assignment details, like your learning aids, and then you could go back to your assignment, finish adding questions, organize it in whatever order you want as far as media and questions, and then continue through your assignment settings. Okay, any other questions so far? Yeah, I do have a question about, um, you showed a setting for tries within a question, mm -hmm. the number of tries. I remember seeing something else where you can limit the number of times students can um, try a question. I'm, I don't understand the difference between those two. That's a really good question, and that's actually something we definitely want to take a look at. So if you go to the next page in your assignment, this is choosing your settings, right? So mm -hmm. you could, you know, take, take a look at your scoring options and so forth. And again, we can do that for all of our assignments at one time as well. We'll look at that. But if you scroll down on this page, you'll, say, you'll see here the attempts per question. So you can limit the number of times students can work each question. So your question is very to the point. Um, there's often confusion between what we saw on the learning aids page and what we see here on that view question details. On the assignment details page, we saw the number of attempts or tries inside each question. And this is the number of attempts per question. The difference is this. Most of the questions that you're using, if not all, in your My Math Lab assignments are algorithmic. So every time a student clicks for a similar problem, they get a similar sort of problem, still using kind of the same concept and objective, but iterating new values. This particular control is saying, how many times would you like them to see a new problem? In other words, if problem five in my homework is factoring a trinomial, how many attempts would I like to give them on problem five? So for example, if I check this and I say three, I'm saying I will let you see three different versions of problem five as you try to attempt your homework. In the view assignment details page that we were on, if we put three there, that means I would get students three attempts on one problem inside that one version of the problem. So let's call the versions here A, B, and C. So let's say they're working on the first version, they're working on version A of the problem, I would give them three attempts on version A to get the problem right. After that, they would be given the correct answer, and if they wanted to try the problem again, they'd now be on version B. Does that make sense? That does. What is the default for the attempts um, tries within a question? If typically, you don't it's, typically, it's three. You will find that there's some variability, obviously, for the true-false question. They only have one attempt to get it right. Uh, multiple choice typically is three. Most of the time that they're working through short answers, it's three attempts. Um, you may find, especially if you're using custom questions, that somebody else wrote a question, maybe from your school, that may have already been altered, but a, most of the time it's three if you're dealing with a short answer or multiple choice. Okay. Okay. So here are other settings on this page for this particular assignment. Um, one of the other really nice features if your school does make any use of the adaptive study plan is that you can have their homework results update the study plan if you choose to do so. That's often helpful, um, and again, that's up to you. Some schools use the study, uh, have the results from quizzes and tests update the study plan. Some use homework quizzes and tests to update the study plan. That, again, that depends on how your courses are designed. Again, you can also modify learning aids right here for the entire assignment. If you'd rather remove a particular resource from the entire assignment, you can do it right here as well. And then you would click to save and assign, just like you would with any other assignment creation. Okay, so we're going to take a look now at creating a quiz, which is the next item on our agenda. We're still under, you know, how to kind of assign learning material. Now, on determining a quiz, same thing. So let's say it was in Chapter 3 and it was Section 2, and we're just going to pick some questions here on our quiz. Love graphing, right? Students really struggle with some of those things. And you're going to say, well, wait a minute. I don't know if you've noticed this, but as we're picking questions, we see these buttons here that say pull and unpull. Do you see those? I see them. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, what do those mean? Have you used those before? I haven't, no. Okay, so what pooling does is it groups questions together 
of the same type to provide a little more variety. So remember how we were concerned that, we, you know, looking at the number of attempts that students would make on a question or that they might rely too much on learning aids or, you know, maybe if they keep trying things over and over, they start to see things that are so similar, they're, they're just lucking out and guessing. One of the ways that we can kind of get around that a little bit, work around that on a quiz or a test, is to pool questions. So what we can do, for example, since four, five, and six here, for example, are all roughly the same level of difficulty, they cover the same topic, the same type of question, I can pool them. So what happens now is even though I have seven questions listed here, their quiz would be one, two, three, one of these would be question four, and then number five. So it adds an additional level of randomness to their quiz. Okay. So what it does... Like Sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. I, I said I like that. I could see that being helpful if they have multiple attempts at the quiz. It's not going to be the same each right. time. Right. This definitely increases the variation of your quizzes or tests. Um, if you do use, for example, like companion study plan at your school or personalized homework, um, you could even then offer the quiz like more than one time. Like you could actually say attempt one, you take the quiz, and then, then you have to do some homework before you can take attempt two. And when students came back to take attempt two, they might, they're going to get a different problem number four. And you can do this as many times as you need to within one quiz. So for example, let's say we want to show some additional test questions and we want to put these three in, nice little application problem, and again, we want to pull these. So now a student would get six questions on their test, so they'd have one, two, three, and then number four, they'd get one of those, then they'd have number five, and then for number six, they'd get one of those. So even though it looks like we picked ten questions, the student's quiz is really only six questions long. Okay, I understand. And then, I like you can, that. Mm -hmm. and then again, you can go through and make your settings and click Save and Assign, and your quiz would be live. Now, one of the things to think about, like you mentioned, maybe students would have more than one attempt on a quiz. That's a really good suggestion. If you did that, for example, you might want to come back to your prerequisite page. And again, notice I'm just clicking prerequisites here right above the assignments. So if I come back to my prerequisites page and I scroll to this demo quiz we just made, notice it says here all attempts, okay, so maybe attempt one we let the students just take the quiz, but before they take attempt two, we want them to go back and review with their homework for chapter three. And again, this is just a demo course, so we're just playing. We would have other assignments here. You can always come back and change this later. But let's say before they take that quiz the second time, we want them to rework some skills reviews, some practice, and you could even choose a percentage that they needed to have earned before that quiz would unlock. So, for example, a lot of times best practice is roughly 80%. Sometimes people have something in the 70s, 80, 85, but 80 kind of seems to be sort of the average best practice. So you're saying, here, well, before you can unlock that quiz, you have to have an 80% on that homework, that special review homework. And then you can click Update. So the first time the student wants to take your quiz, they don't have to worry about that. But the second time they're going to take that quiz, they're going to need to work through that homework section first. You like that feature? I do. And you're probably starting to think, wow, there's a lot of things in here that I could do. That's the beauty of my math lab. It's very flexible and very powerful, but it is going to take some time in tweaking to kind of get it to where you'd like it to be. Does your school use personalized homework at all, or are you familiar with that? Um, I don't think so in the courses I've taught. I'm not familiar with it. Okay, well, let's take a look at how to do personalized homework. It may be a tool that you want to use in your own course. It can also be just so that you kind of understand how it works if you end up teaching a new course and they make use of it. We've already alluded to personalized homework. What do you think personalized homework is? Like how would you envision that working? That it would be based on what each student needs somehow. Um, so not everybody's same assignment is what I 
what I would think. Right. Well, that's exactly what it is. So here, for example, is a homework assignment for Section 1 in our book. This is the Martin Gay book that we're working in. And if we wanted to make Section 1 three personalized homework, we would click this box, and you'll notice it says, yes, we're going to personalize this assignment based on objectives that were mastered in a particular test or quiz. So if you're going to use personalized homework, what happens is you need to assign a quiz or a pretest before students start their homework and whatever they master on that quiz is marked off as completed in their homework. It's a huge motivator for students. If we have some time later, I can even show you a course where we have some student results and you can kind of see what that looks like. But basically what happens is their homework is marked off as being completed. So they might click on their Chapter 1, um, Section 3 homework, and 10 out of the 15 problems are marked as checked off already because they mastered that material on their quiz. So they really like that. What I find, however, in my courses, and I know I've talked with other faculty who found this too, sometimes this works really well in courses. Other courses or topic matter, you know, content matter, it doesn't seem to be as a motivator for students. What I find often is that it works really well in the beginning of the semester, but as you get into more complicated material, like, you know, in your sequential courses such as college algebra, you know, going from intermediate to college algebra, as you work into material where students have fewer prerequisite skills or they don't recall as much material, then they don't have as much success with their personalized homework, they don't have the ability to test out as much. So sometimes I might only use personalized homework even through part of the semester, just in the beginning as a motivator for students. Um, in my liberal arts classes that I teach, it worked a lot better because that's more of a survey course. So in one chapter they might have tested out of more, in another chapter maybe they didn't, but we could pretty much use that effectively through the entire semester. And again, that depends on your student population as well as the course you're teaching. So here's our long assignment pre-made, and again, this is just a sample. You notice we have some media in, and we have our homework problem selected. It looks just like a typical homework assignment, except we made it that we wanted it to be personalized, so there should be some difference somewhere. The only difference was in the beginning when we checked off that box to personalize this homework based on the results of that quiz. So we're going to click Next after we picked our questions and organized our homework. And on this page, again, our settings page, you'll see that the prerequisite is now, it's kind of grayed out here, but it does show that the prerequisite for this homework is the Chapter 1 quiz. You could change it if you needed to, but this is indicating now that this homework is personalized. And you could go through here and make any other changes on settings that you would need to and click Save and Assign. Now, if a student would Go to the menu, let's move out of the assignment manager for a minute, let's go to the menu and take a look at this from the student perspective. What kind of message would they get? So you may have seen this before, but if a student clicks, for example, on homework or on a quiz or test that had a little prerequisite, you'd see a little green flag. And so we're telling the students here, you can't open this homework until you do the Chapter 1 quiz first. And typically that would have applied to a couple of assignments. You can see here that I have it marked for sections one and two. It may be all of your chapter, it may be part of your chapter, however you chose to set that up, but they would have to take the quiz before they could unlock their homework. Okay. Now, keeping in mind with that, if you're going to use any form of mastery in your course, we're going to make a little side trip here to what's called the study plan manager. And the study plan manager also has some information about mastery settings, things that affect mastery. So if you start thinking, oh, I really love personalized homework, and I think I'm going to make use of this study plan, you're going to want to come here and start taking a little bit of a look at mastery settings in your course. And again, this is just kind of an aside, but oftentimes when we start exploring personalized learning, we get kind of excited. I know for myself, I started working with the personalized homework, and then I thought I want to use the study plan. You need to come here and make some customizations. We do have an entire training session on just using personalized features in your course, and I would really encourage you, you know, down the road to take a look at that one. Um, the adaptive features in, the, in my math lab are very powerful, and you have a lot of flexibility as to how you want to use it in your course. So just a little aside there for you. <clears throat> Any questions so far? No, so far so good. Okay, 
So we're on our agenda. We're going to continue on. We're going to take a look at kind of enhancing your homework with some other features. So we're going to go back to a homework assignment we've already made. So let's pick one of these. And again, you can do this in your own copy of your course and kind of play around. This is a really nice feature. So let's say we're working on Section 1.4 and we've got all these homework questions in here. But you know, sometimes these questions kind of are very similar. Maybe we want to provide a little more variety. So we're thinking, instead of having so many of these same types of questions in here, is there anything else I could do to kind of enhance this homework assignment? So I'm thinking about what I could add to augment. Well, we just looked at some features. We could remove learning aids. We could add media. But what else could I do? I'd like to add some other types of questions for my students to work with. One of the neat features with my math lab is that you can actually add questions from other books. So I don't know if you, like me, have taught out of, you know, a lot of different books, a lot of different editions over time. But for example, we taught out of Martin Gay, this particular textbook, for literally probably 15 years at our school. And then we switched. But there were a couple problems that we all really kind of had liked, and we wanted to add them to our current assignment. Um, prior to Martin Gay, they had used Bittinger resources, and again, there were, some, there were some questions that people really liked. So if you, for example, wanted to add a question from another book, you simply click this change. See, here's your book selection, Martin Gay, the title. Click change, and you'll come up with this new box that actually gives you a listing of other books that Pearson makes. And you can see it, it definitely includes beginning and intermediate algebra, but you're also going to see other resources here as well. Now, you could scroll through this, a little bit time consuming, or if you know exactly what other book that problem came from, you can just type in Bittinger, for example, and then up will come all of the books that he's written, and you can then choose which one you're looking for. So I want Introductory and Intermediate Algebra. I'm going to select the book, and you're going to see that now when I click the drop-down menu, my sections, my topics, my questions, my numbering are all from the Bittinger book. So even though this is still my Martin Gay assignment, I can now go in here and go, oh, I really, really like, you know, we're looking at exponents and order of operations, so, you know, I can match the section, okay, and I can drill down to objectives if I even want to, and then I can say I'd like to just add these three particular problems because I like those problems. You can preview them or you might have the old book. When you add them to your assignment, you can tell that they're from another textbook because there's a small asterisk. And if you scroll over it, it will tell you what book it's copied from. So one of the nice reasons to use this is that questions from other books can enhance your assignments. They do provide some variety in the types of problems your students are working on. And you can add up to 20 questions per one assignment. You do have to have one question from your existing book, but you can add up to 20 questions from a combination of other books. So for example, in my statistics course, I actually, for in some of the chapters, in one chapter in particular I can think of, I have problems from four other books so that my students are exposed to the verbiage that might be slightly different, or they might have a word problem, kind of an application of what we were learning that I really, really liked. So this provides some nice variety. Okay. Another thing that you can do then when you're, if you're done with this, you want to return to your course textbook. You just click to return. And another thing we could do here to provide some variety to this homework assignment or, or even to a quiz or a test, and you saw me, you might have seen me do this earlier, but I clicked when we were looking at questions here, let's go back to our section. So when we were working on this particular section, I clicked show additional test bank questions. So for example, Maybe I'm translating sentences, expressions into mathematical sentences, and I would like to have some additional questions. So if I click those, I will see some additional ones, and they are coded as TB, test bank. Okay? Now you'll see that here it's a short answer. If you can preview, if you can see the preview. So number 87 is a short answer. You just have to type the equation or inequality. However, if I would scroll to a test bank question, I actually have the option then of assigning some multiple choice as well. So sometimes 
faculty would like to make use of those. But the TB or the test bank questions provide some additional questions available for you to assign. And again, you are just wanting to provide some variety for your homework and for your students to practice. I've seen those test bank questions. They're always multiple choice, choice, aren't they? Pretty much most of the time, yes. Okay. With rare exception. And so, you know, some faculty are very averse to using the multiple choice. Other times you like to throw them in to provide a little variety. Sometimes I'll put one or two in my assignment just because it's something different for students and they kind of like that. Um, but again, it does provide variety and I have found it helpful if you're doing a particular section where there are very few questions. If you can look in other books, like I just showed you, or you could add the test bank questions, that will give you a little more option. You don't want to just keep assigning five copies of the same question. You'd like to have some variety. So it does allow you some versatility, but typically they are multiple choice. That is correct. Okay. Okay. And again, you know, keeping in mind other things we looked here before, I'm just going to click and go back here to the assignment details a little bit. Um, we mentioned a few of these before, but just keep in mind, you can actually come back in here and take a look at those questions. Even if they're from other books, you can take a look at how long is it going to take my students? You know, what's the numeric answer tolerance? How many attempts do I give them? Do they get credit if they don't simplify their answer? So you can modify quite a bit of different resources, again, on that view assignment details page. Notice over here to the right that the estimated time for this assignment is listed. It does show 10 minutes and 3 seconds, and it has a little plus sign after it. That plus sign indicates that it's going to be more time, but the questions that are not marked with, for example, like number 9, they don't have any metrics in front of them. We're not sure how long it's going to take students to complete that on average. So we're just estimating the amount of time, and since you have several of those in this assignment, this estimated time is indicating, well, you know, it's at least 10 minutes, but since you have a couple more questions that don't have metrics, it's going to be longer than that. I usually use this as a nice ballpark. So for example, if I would look at this homework assignment and it said 10 minutes and 3 seconds, I would feel pretty confident that most of my students are going to be done within a half an hour of work. Not every student, some students might take a little more time, but typically if they're working through and they're pacing themselves and they're watching the media, a half an hour may be a reasonable amount of time. I'm not as concerned on homework, however, as I am on quizzes or tests, because on quizzes or tests they are timed in many cases. So if I'm giving them a half an hour quiz, I don't want to see that this shows 25 minutes because my typical student's not going to get done then. So I don't know if you've used those estimated time as a measure, but it's just a nice little tool to kind of have a little bit of a gauge of how long it might take students. Yeah, I've noticed that, and it's helpful. My students usually take longer than what's listed there, too. Right, and I found that most of mine take, you know, I might have a few that are done, for example, on this homework assignment in 10 or 15 minutes, but I could probably double this and say that that's a good measure and still have some students that don't get done. Now, speaking of good little tips and tricks, let's say that we were looking at a particular problem and we wanted to give students, this is in our homework, we clicked to open this in our homework, but we wanted to give students a little tip when they're working on this particular problem. So this is the mobile version. Otherwise, if you're in the traditional version for your MyMath lab, these would just be listed on the side. But on either of these, we can click Add Instructor Tips. I don't know if you've seen this cool little feature, but you can actually put a little note here to students. Like, I use this a lot in my courses on certain problems where I know students might take a wrong turn, that they make, there are certain mistakes that a lot of students make. If I just want to remind them of something we've talked about in class or a particular um, rule or suggestion, even a tip in the book, I might refer them to it. So you could say, for example, let's say here, be sure to check your integer work, you know, or be sure to check your computations, you know, whatever it is that you want to tell them. So for example, if some are positive and some are negative and students kind of forget to check their signs, put a little note in. And from now on, when the students click on that problem, that little note is going to pop up when they're doing their work. So let's close that. And we could go in and do that for another question. So again, we could go in, problem nine. Same thing, question help, add instructor tip. And you can change it up a little bit. You could say watch your signs. Um, 
recall in class we looked at this particular method. I will say that there have been a few times that I have removed, for example, the view and example and the help me solve it from a problem and instead I put in an instructor tip based on something we did in class so that students can recall some material the way we went through it together in class and they're not distracted but because sometimes the explanations are maybe longer or a little more tedious and then students get frustrated trying to work through a long example. Um, maybe we looked at something slightly differently. So that's a nice way, again, to add a little instructor tip to a question. So that's one for number nine. So we're going to go ahead and save this assignment and see what it looks like from a student view. Because we made some changes there, so it's always nice to say, what does this look like? So we go out to our main menu. In this particular case, we're going to click Assignments, and we're going to click on Section 1-4. And let's go to number nine. Now this is number nine where we stuck a instructor tip. So the student's question is loading for them to do their homework. <clears throat> and up pops the instructor tip. Notice I didn't have to click anything for it. It automatically showed up there. So I'm looking at my homework problem. My instructor tip's right there. I can read the tip or if it's a longer example, I can read through the example and then click close and go ahead and do my homework. Okay, did the little plus symbol um, that showed up by that tip mean anything? No, it's just part of the coding. Okay. So if we look at the view instructor tip and we would accidentally, if we would, for example, click on that, all that does is just open up a page where it explains to us a little bit more of the uh, coding behind the scenes. It just has to do with the formatting, so you don't okay. need to worry about that. I, always, I do tell my students that, that's a really good question because I've had a few that click and go, what's this? I have an error in my course. It's just coding. Good mm -hmm. eye, you're very observant. <laughs> so we're going to close our homework, okay? And we're gonna go back, and just before we move back to looking at some other things, notice here, remember how we changed the number of times that they could complete each question? It's showing up here now. So we're telling them that, for example, if I click on question two, that will be my first attempt. And I'll be able to click on it two more times to try two more iterations. So I'll have versions one, two, and three of question two, and then after that I'll be done. And I will not be able to work that question again. So you can see some of those changes we've been making as we work in our assignments are, are showing up, which is really good. Okay. How are we doing on time? We're scheduled for up to 90 minutes. We're at about a quarter of. Are you good for a little while yet? Yes, I am. Good. Okay, so moving on on our agenda, we're looking at mastery approach. And I mentioned this before. Since we have the time, let's take a look at a little bit more about mastery um, and how to configure your tools in my math lab to make it work. So, for example, creating, you probably heard, very, uh, very much a buzzword in education, the idea of learning paths for students to guide them more specifically through the course. For example, you'll notice that one very quick thing that sometimes we do instead of having separate homework, quizzes, and task links, and study plan links, is this particular course sample just has assignments. Take students to one place for all your work. There's also a sample here, for example, where you could go to chapter four, and you could have a menu that showed chapters one, two, three, and four, and when you click on chapter four, students could go directly to homework, quiz, test, and all the resources for chapter four. How are your courses set up? Do you typically use buttons here that are homework, quiz, quizzes and tests, and then study plan? Do you use assignments? Do you have a modular menu, kind of chapter by chapter? How's yours work? Um, I think it's just what comes by default when the course is set up. I don't usually customize it. I'll just tell students to, you know, go in and do their homework. So I haven't customized it. Okay. So you can start to think about, and again, this is probably not something you're going to do overnight, but maybe for the next semester or maybe, you know, the following academic year, you can start working on creating, you know, how would you like your course menu to look if you could completely rearrange it? Because we do have the ability to manage our course and come in here to this course menu and rearrange things or remove things or restore things. So we can really make it flow the way you'd like it to for your students. 
So let's talk a little bit about mastery. We'll come back and, you know, we can always discuss the idea of learning paths down the road as you're thinking about what you want it to look like. But one thing you want to do, if you are going to make any use of mastery or you want to do this learning path kind of approach, you want to think about, again, the settings in your course. So some instructors, even in lieu of homework, use the study plan as homework. Others use the study plan as, as what we call a companion study plan, or for each test you can have a little built-in review. Before you do any of that, you want to modify your settings. So as you mentioned, if you copy a default course, these settings are all at 100%. So you would want to come in here and modify them to whatever you felt was appropriate. Now in my own courses, I do allow the homework to update the study plan that students are working on, but I make the homework have a higher standard for mastery since I know students are using learning aids. Quizzes and tests, I know that students cannot use learning aids, so I leave that at 80%. These are totally customizable. They can all be different values. However, you would like to set that up. The one here is Quiz Me. Those are little mini quizzes that are one objective at the time. It's a really great tool for students to kind of work on small chunks of material. Those are in the study plan. Those are not part of your grade. Those are just for students to review. But those quizzes are on one objective at a time. Typically, they have five questions. So I usually leave the mastery for that at 80%. So you can have one wrong you know, still pass, but it gives students a way to chunk the material and to focus on one objective at a time. You can actually come in here then and you notice it will say update your, your difficulty distributions. Typically, it will be 1, 3, 1, 0, but you can change it. So in other words, on a little quiz me, they'll have an easy question, three medium questions, and one hard question. The way that those are marked as metrics are those little icons we saw back when we were creating an assignment. So if we found historically that students had, you know, medium level of difficulty on a particular problem, here we're saying we'll take three of those types of questions in a quiz me and then click update. You can come back at any time and change this. You can also then come in and drill down and determine what questions would be in your study plan. And again, this is covered in extensive detail in our adaptive training. But I'm just going to mention here, this is something worth taking note of, especially if you want students to use a study plan. Do you ever encourage your students to use a study plan at all? Um, I have it there where they can do extra practice, but I haven't, I don't require it. Right. That's what I had done for the longest time. Did you ever click on that and see, for example, how many questions are in one section? Well, I knew there were a lot because I would just click to see what students would see, but I haven't gone into these settings. Right. So, for example, here, if you click, if you see here, like, Section 2.2, there's 70 questions. So, if students are working on, you know, additional multiplication properties of equality and solving equations, they have 70 questions here. If they came here for extra practice, they might be a little overwhelmed. The so one of the tools that we cover is that you can actually modify the number of questions pretty easily. So, you could align it with your assignments and apply it, or you could say, you know what, just show students every nth question. Let's just say we show every fifth question. So now instead of 70, students would only see 14 here for this section to practice. So there's different ways to come in. And again, we cover this in extensive detail. <clears throat> I'm also going to show you some links before we um, sign off of our WebEx today, where we have some resources and printable guides and materials to walk you through processes about all sorts of things that we're learning about today. But you could actually come in here into the study plan and change the number of questions or which questions your students would see if they did go to the study plan. And that, that would definitely be helpful, I see. <laughs> right. I know that my students would, oh, I'm going to work on the study plan, and then they'd often go there and go, oh, I, I, that's just too much. I can't do that. And I don't want them to give up. I want them to make use of it. So that's one really cool tool that we can use to change that. And another one, if we go back to the assignments where we were earlier, the assignment manager, another one that we can do is we can actually link the study plan with a quiz or a test, but only the piece that applies to that quiz or test. Let me show you what that looks like. This is, this is a really, really neat feature, and I was so excited when they came out with this update. I use it in all of my courses, love it. My students like it, too. So you'll notice on this page, Typically, when you're creating or editing a test or quiz, you have three steps. You start, 
You know, you name it, you add your content, and then you do your settings. But there's this box here, you may have seen this when you were creating a quiz or test, that says to assign a companion study plan. If you click to assign it, you suddenly have step four. And that is, you're going to define exactly what that study plan should include. And this is exciting, I'm going to show you why in a minute. So then we go to our next page, and notice here we already had a, a, a quiz, and again, this is just a sample quiz. My quizzes would never be this long, but just a sample quiz. <clears throat> so once I'm happy with the sample quiz, I click Next. And then I have my settings, again, familiar territory. And then I click Next. This takes me to a new page, never seen this page before. Well, this is the page where we define the study plan. What exactly do we want students to be working on if they take this chapter quiz? It automatically populates with questions with the objectives that you have on your quiz or test. So right now, that extensive chapter quiz actually has 24 different objectives. So all 24 of them are showing up in my study plan. I can click and I can actually drill down even to the objective level and say, well, you know, okay, combine like terms, okay. Well, maybe I need students to really understand the difference between like and unlike terms. What would happen if I check that box? We'll look up here. There's now 25 objectives in my study plan. I can drill through each section even if I wanted to and add objectives if I needed to for assessment purposes. What I love about this is that I can go through here and make sure, for example, that the objectives are on here. Even if maybe I didn't have a word problem on the test about interest, I want my students to still practice that because it might be on their test for the course that they take in the classroom. So I'm going to check that box just to make sure it's included. The other thing you can do is you can even go to a prior chapter and you can say, well, you know what, I really want students to review the properties of real numbers because what I find when we start equations is that they're still struggling with addition and subtraction, multiplication, division of integers, and they forget some of that. So I could come in here and add that. Or I could come in here and just say subtracting real numbers, add and subtract real numbers. Maybe I just want to add one objective. Do you see what we can do? So I can come in here and build in additional review into my study plan. And then, by the way, what this is saying is before students could unlock that chapter quiz, they would have to have all 25 objectives. Typically, I give my students a little bit of leeway. Maybe I'll say, well, you have to have 21 or 20 of those objectives before your, test will, your quiz will unlock. So we're going to click Assign. I'm going to show you what this looks like from a student's perspective. This is so much more manageable in a study plan. So let's go back to our main menu. Now I'm a student and I want to work on that chapter quiz. Okay, so here's my chapter quiz and here's my study plan. Now, if I scroll through here, I'm going to see all 25 objectives because I haven't done, obviously I haven't done any of the homework for chapter two or done anything else. Once I've done that, I would show some of them have been mastered at the bottom of my page, and the ones I still need to work I would be up here. Notice it includes 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, so forth, and it also includes 1, 6, because I know that I need to review adding and subtracting real numbers. So I get some extra practice. So a student can come to the study plan, they can watch a video, there's some recommended media, they can go right to the quiz me if they think they know what they're doing and test out of that objective, and then move on to another objective or they can go in here and practice. Now, you'll notice if they click in here to practice, on one particular section, this only shows 12 questions for that particular objective. It breaks it down by objective. If we go into two, four, there's 10 on that particular one objective. Okay, so you can see that this is by objective, so it looks smaller here, but still, when we modify the total number of questions in the study plan, we can make this a lot smaller. So students might come here and only see five, for example. So it's a lot less overwhelming. Because right now, if they come here and click on a lot of these, they're going to see quite a few questions. Here's seven on one objective. Here's yeah, 20, we 25 objectives. It turns out to be a lot. Right. So you can drill down and do some changes to that. 
and really get this a little more fine-tuned. Also by that, making sure that students are only seeing the types of questions you want, because keep in mind that the study plan has everything in it that's in your test bank. So you may want to, for example, make sure that students aren't going to see a particular chapter or a particular section that you don't cover in your course, and you can delete that, like you can hide that from your study plan. Let me show you a nice little trick. You can even remove a chapter at the course level from your study plan. If you click on Edit, the My Math Lab settings, and you scroll down, see where it says Coverage? I'm going to click Edit. And on this page, I can say, for example, if your course only covers one to six, then you can delete the other chapters. which means when you go to create a homework or quiz or test, you're only going to see the orientation chapter in chapters 1 to 6. In your study plan, you're only going to see orientation chapters in chapters 1 to 6. These are not being deleted from your ebook or anything, but they're just being pulled out of your test bank so that you're not looking at a sheer number of chapters and sections that you don't even cover. And it's extra insurance. Your students will not be clicking on material that's not in your course. You do want to make sure to check, though, down here that you keep your appendices because oftentimes they have some review or additional material that you might want. So let's see, we might keep decimals, we might keep basic algebra, um, we're not going to need matrices, don't need determinants. Oh, yeah, mean, median, mode. Okay, we'll keep that. And then we'll click Next. And then, of course, you can also modify learning aids. So maybe your entire course, we mentioned this, we alluded to this earlier today, you might want to remove a learning aid from your entire course. I actually removed view an example so that students have to work through the problem. Instead of just passively reading through it, the Help Me Solve It makes them interact with that a little bit, and I like that. The other thing to know, by the way, is if you limit the number of attempts on the problem and they use a Help Me Solve It, that actually counts as one of their attempts. So it's making them work through it, not just read over it. So you can choose to remove that or, or not, and then click Save. And it will give you a little bit of a prompt that it's, you know, changing and making course updates. But now if you would go back to your menu, let's go back into making an assignment and see what happened when we did that. And here again is a classic example as to why we don't want to do this in a course we're teaching in. It's always good to play around in a copy of a course or just in a demo course. So we're going to go back in, we're going to pretend we're making an assignment, working on an assignment. So let's see what happens now when we come in. Notice all I have to choose from is the orientation questions in chapters 1 to 6. So instead of having to scroll through maybe 14 chapters or something like that, I just see what I'm working with. The flip side that is... I, I'm sorry? I like that a lot. Just a question. Um, you said when students go to the e-book, so they can still see the whole book. You know, if there's some students who want to work ahead or just have access to the whole book, that doesn't right. take away. Right. If you click, oh. for example, on your multimedia library, it'll show these chapters here, but your e-text will still show everything. So your e-book does not change. Your multimedia library actually changed, which is probably better for students to focus on what you're working on. But if a student wanted to go and access the entire course, they can actually still come in here, they can click on the table of contents, and notice they can go through 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, tell them they can see it all. Okay. They can scroll through the menu here on the left-hand side, and let's say, like you said, they want to work ahead. Love when you get students like that, right? They want to go, I want to work on what I need for next semester in algebra. So they can go ahead and click on Chapter 7 and move right to Rational Expressions. Okay. That's really so good. It's, still, it's still there, but your typical student, or at least my typical student, I really find the drilling down to what we need for this course is beneficial. So, for example, when they go to their multimedia, they're only going to see the chapters we're doing. They're only going to see the multimedia and PowerPoints and all of that for what we're using. So it's a nice way to kind of guide students a little bit more. Of course, the other way, too, is if you want to put direct chapters on your menu and have, you know, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then nothing else, you know, so students aren't getting distracted going to materials that you're not using. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the things that we could also look at um, 
I'm going to kind of jump slightly on our agenda, but we were actually here, so I'm going to go back to this while it's fresh in our minds. On the Edit the My Math Lab settings where we were just looking at coverage, one of the other things we could do was to manage a lockdown browser, and so I want to make sure that we've covered that so you understand what that is. This may or may not be something that you need at this time, but it may be something that you want to use in the future. So the lockdown browser, if you use a lockdown browser, what that indicates, or, or restricting students to take IP-restricted quizzes and tests, the other option, what that means is if you use those tools, students must, for example, take the test on a specific set of computers, excuse me, they must take their test under a set of restricted computers in a certain lab in a certain part of campus. IT would have to work with you on that. Or if you use the lockdown browser, what that means is students, when they're taking a test or quiz, cannot open any other website on that computer. So as soon as you start a test with a lockdown browser, it prohibits them from, for example, opening up a homework assignment or going to their ebook or something like that. There are some additional options here. Um, you can also select specific programs, and again, this is something that you would need to work with your IT department on, but that can be a tool, particularly if you need to, for example, teach in an online course, or you have, if your school is looking at doing like an emporium, you know, where they have more students working independently, they may want to restrict testing for that to a particular computer lab, so they can use that option as well. Okay, just so that you've seen that um, may not be something as much that you need to be concerned with now, but it's down the road they're indicating, hey, we want you to teach an online course or we, you know, we're going to be moving to an Emporium model. Those might be some good suggestions that you and your colleagues would take a look at. Would students have to install software to use the, the lockdown browser? They initially do when you run a browser check. There's, um, there's a little bit of a prompt there that they want to make sure that you do have that. Um, once and done kind of thing. Yep. If you want to do individual tests or quizzes, you would use the lockdown browser as required just when you're doing the settings for the quiz. If you do it at this level, it's the entire course. So sometimes, for example, they will do it just for the final exam or for a midterm and a final. If you do it at the course level where we just were, that applies to every single test or quiz that's going to be administered. Does that make sense? Okay, that does. Okay. Other questions so far? <laughs> no. I'm following. Getting lots of information. Yes. Yeah. It's helpful, though. Oops, I just accidentally clicked out here. Sorry about that. So one other feature is something, again, we've kind of seen it as we've been poking around today on our assignments, but um, let's go back into our assignment manager, and we're going to create an assignment. Now you'll notice I picked a different course. I picked a college algebra here. I don't know if this is one that you teach out of, but just to shake it up a little bit, we're going to take a look at polynomial functions. Which one would you like to choose from here? Uh, quadratic. You really enjoy it? I like that. Mm -hmm. Function. Quadratic functions. Okay, so we're going to pop over a little question or two here. Get a little graphing in there, something different to look at, right? Let's see characteristics of a parabola. So we're starting to work on a homework assignment, put some practice in here. <clears throat> now, as we're working through this assignment, we want to take a look, for example, and think about things like any prerequisites, do we want to add questions from other books, but there's also one other thing that we haven't looked at yet, and that is maybe on one of these really hard questions or on one question that I know really covers a particular objective, I would like my students to show the work. So I'm going to go back and click those assignment details. If you recall here, there was one here we could have students show the work. You see that? 
I do. Uh -huh. So I can come in and click that box and say students can share the work. The other thing I can do is actually just click right on the question. And at the bottom, I can click student to show the work. Okay? So what that means is students going to have to show me what they did for that particular problem. So let's take a look at what that looks like from the student's view. And by the way, again, I'm going to show you some resources in a little bit of time that we have. And we, that includes that we have a video from the instructor's perspective for setting up showing work. We also have a video from the student perspective so that you can kind of share with your students even ahead of time. If you decided to use this feature, you can show them how it would work. So let's click on our demo assignment here. And you'll notice if I click on my homework, immediately I see a little tiny SW in red that indicates show work. So when I get to this particular question, I'm going to be able to read over my question, but you'll, have, you'll see there's a pop-up block right away that occurs here. This pop-up is where I'm going to put my work. So I can enter, I can still enter things in there, type in answers, work through the problem, but my instructor wants me to show my work. So maybe that means I'm going to simply upload a picture of my work. So I could take a picture, I could then upload it from my phone, from my computer, whatever, my iPad, of the work I did. I could write on here with the mouse, which is a little cumbersome. Um, I could type in here if I'm typing out some text. Most of my students, to be honest, use the upload a picture feature so they can show me how they were working through the problem. And then once they have that, they can scroll down, they can click Save. Okay, so it says Show Work, Save. And then click Save. They will be prompted if they did not show work. You saw that little prompt that says show work. Your instructor wanted that. From the instructor's perspective then, when we clicked on the grade book, we would go in and we would say, okay, well, let's see. You opened up that homework problem. Let's see if Diane did her homework. I'm going to check it because I would have to grade some of that. And I would look here and I would see what they had for their answers. I could review the show work. I could see what image had been uploaded or what work was here. I could then save that, put the points in. Let's say, okay, well, you only showed me part of the work. I'll give you two-thirds of the credit or whatever and click Submit Grade. Now, again, notice that this is one point. I don't leave it at it was one point. I change these. So I might make them five points or four points so that it's easier then for me to give a student partial credit. I have a question. When you were reviewing the show work, can you – um, annotate or put comments on what they submitted? That's a really good question. So let's go back into review work. And let's see what this looks like. So let's say a student has, has an image in here, and I'm trying to click in here. You'll notice it does not allow me to click in here and to put anything there, right? But I can put add a comment. And I can say on your show work, you neglected to show how to compute the values for X and Y on your vertex. And I can click Save. And from now on, when the student goes to review their work, they will see that note from the instructor. Have you used that feature at all when you reviewed work before? I haven't. I was aware of it, but I haven't used it. Okay. So, for example, if I go back and I click on that, you can see now I'm going in as a student and my question has been scored. And I can go back in here and see what the student, I can go back in here and see what my, you know, <coughs> excuse me, what I did on the question. I could try it again maybe if it wasn't due yet. If I want to review what my instructor left me, then I would just click to review from my grade book and I can see the instructor's comment. So I can review it. And you can see here the little icon, it says instructor comment. It looks like a little bobblehead with a bubble above it. So if I click oh. on my review, now remember I'm going through my grade book. I'm no longer in my homework. Notice that the instructor's comment pops up right away. Okay. Okay. I use this a lot when I review tests and I leave comments for students, like you forgot to, you know, you forgot to factor out the common factor, you didn't reduce your weight, whatever it is. And I actually keep a Word file where I have common comments for my course. So because I teach, for example, a lot of the same thing, um, you know, for college algebra, for chapter two, I know the students typically make certain mistakes on the test. I actually have like a canned file that I can just go, you know, I've typed it out and I can just copy, paste, and save. But that's helpful for students when they're reviewing their tests. 
so they can come back in and take a look at what they did. Okay. The other thing, speaking of reviewing tests, since we're there, and again, this isn't necessarily formally on our agenda at this time, but when you're setting your settings for multiple assignments or, or for each individual assignment, I like to do them all at one time. So you click on more assignment tools, settings for multiple assignments. Here's a really nice one to do when students are reviewing, for example, a test. So you can come in here and you can choose partial credit. You can show like what credit do we want to give for showing work. Like you want to give them 50% credit just for doing the work, submitting the work, or scoring the question correctly, or however. You can make all those changes here. Password if necessary, time limit if necessary, questions. I always scramble the order so that nobody gets a test that looks just like the one sitting next to them. Um, you know, review options, updating the study plan, all those kinds of things. Those are all important. Here's where I wanted to look right now, though, since we were just talking about students reviewing a test. So I'm going to say turn on learning aids, and you're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want students to have a learning aid for a test. No, 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 not for the test, but for review mode only. And then I click change, and it will give me a little pop-up. And you know what? When you're reviewing your test, you can have any learning aids that are available. So you can have help me solve it, you can have the examples, you can have videos, your textbook, whatever. You may or may not want to leave your ask my instructor option on here. Click OK. Now, again, I turned on all those learning aids for students, but only when they're reviewing their test. So if they've done a test, instead of emailing you and going, what did I get wrong on 6? What did I get wrong on 8? What did I do wrong on 10? They can go back and they can review their test themselves and make use of learning aids to help figure out what they're doing incorrectly. When I started doing this, it dramatically reduced the amount of email that I got. And I do want to hear from my students. Don't get me wrong. I really would like to communicate with them. I want to know where they're struggling. But there were tools already in place for them to use to self-review. I want to encourage them to do it. So this is a really nice feature that you can use to help students self-review. And again, then your other review options. So students can see their test score. Students can review their test. If you are testing and you don't want them to, for example, share around or show anybody else, you may want to say only immediately after they test it, or maybe you don't want to let them see it until after a due date if you're testing online. That's entirely up to you. Um, click to update the study plan, and then do you want them to be able to print, whatever, and then click apply your settings. And you can do that for homework, quizzes, and tests, you know, make your settings for the entire course at one time, which is so much faster than doing it one assignment at a time. Okay. So just a little heads up, if you do want to do a show work question, whether it's in your homework or your test, you do not want to do this for a large percentage of assignment. Maybe just a question or two. Uh, maybe like 10% of your assignment at most because you will need to grade all of this and students will need to wait for you to provide feedback. So I like to use this maybe on just a specific question or two on assignments on a test on ones that I really want to be able to see them show their work. Questions? No, I, I look forward to trying that one out. The show work. Mm -hmm. And again, prerequisites we visited here before. Um, you know, keep in mind there are a lot of different places you can go in this course. Change your prerequisites, change your dates. You worked with did that before, I'm sure. Um, assignment mm -hmm. tools if you need to make changes for specific students. If you have, for example, a student in your classroom who needs accommodations or extended testing time, um, there are a lot of other tools and resources in here. But I do want to be cognizant of the fact that your brain is probably feeling a little bit full right now. We've covered a lot of different material. Um, you do have the guide to go back and refer back to. But I do want to make a point of showing you um, some of the other resources here. So in addition to these you know, unique student cases, where else can we go for some resources? So I'm going to click on MyMathLab.com. If you do not log in, if you simply go to MyMathLab.com, you'll notice it's the training and support link. And if you click on that, you have access to a lot of material. 
Um, the Get Trained page has some pre-recorded workshops, like I alluded to the fact that there are some other workshops, like this one we're doing today. So you can always visit here and access some other workshops. For example, if you got all excited about personalized learning, or if you wanted to learn more about using your grade book, or if you ended up having to teach a statistics course, you could come here and watch one of the other pre-recorded workshops. You can access a pretty detailed implementation guide. And what I'm going to do is let this load and show you that there are some modules that specifically would be helpful based upon things we talked about today. For example, creating effective assignments with the assignment manager, module five, and module six, designing adaptive learning. There's some things we alluded to in there. Of course, none of these are standalone. In order to have effective assignments, you're also gonna be thinking about effective gradebook policies and so forth, but you can come in here and take a look at specific areas of focus. You can choose to print part of the document or even save it as a PDF, but it's a great reference tool. The other place you might like to go would be to go to youtube.com. You might want to jot down this URL, youtube.com backslash Pearson Math Stats. So in addition to the videos we have on the training site, there are some updated videos and some new resources that you can click here, and there's a how-to playlist. So you can scroll down this how-to playlist and get some of those other special things like we talked about. I mentioned, for example, um, showing work. You know, if you want to show your student work in my math lab, exploring student views in my math lab, student resources, using the assignment button instead of having homework, quizzes, tests, like we talked about that, you said you still use kind of like the default settings in the course. So if you want to make one quick change, you can watch a little video here. It's less than three minutes, and it'll show you how to have an assignments button instead of homework, quizzes, tests, and study plan. I'll tell you one of the things that when I did that for my students, fewer of them are missing assignments because everything's in one spot. They don't have to click anywhere else. Modifying learning aids like we talked about today, using the study plan, um, you know, upgrading your course to a new edition because eventually we all have to deal with that. What kinds of things do we need to think about when we're doing that? Um, personalized homework putting media in homework. A lot of the things that we talked about today are in here. There's a student work, you know, showing student work, um, nonlinear graphs in my math lab, creating your own questions if you really want to get into it down the road, that kind of thing. So there's some really great resources here. So again, it's youtube.com backslash Pearson Math Stats, and you can go right to their playlist. In addition to the tutorial videos, that are on the training page. So you can come in here and just, you know, how do I create a homework assignment, that kind of thing. Okay? And you're welcome at any time, too, to email me as well. You can also email our My Math Lab training, um, or My Math Lab training at Pearson.com email if you have questions or you need some additional resources. Just want to review something like, you know, how do I make individual assignment settings? I can't find the video. Or, you know, what's a quick trick I could do? You know, what are my quick tricks that I absolutely love? And I'm hoping you know this one. You know, what if I do need to make some quick information? You know, search an email by criteria. Do you ever get to use that one? Um, no, I haven't seen that one. Okay. This is, you know what, I've had people say that this might be the entire reason I came to this workshop today. I hope that's not the only thing you learned but it's a really powerful tool. So let's say we want to remind students, for example, that they haven't completed an assignment yet. You've worked so hard to create quality assignments and you really want your students to be successful, but you want to point out to them that they haven't even done a particular assignment. So you can choose that assignment. You can say your score is below 70 or you haven't done anything at all. And you can send them an email, super quick. Obviously there's no students in this particular demo course. You would type your email and click send, done. You can also look by overall score. You can look by work activity. When did you last log in? I don't know about your students, but some of mine are very good at procrastinating. And so I might send them a reminder saying, you have work due tomorrow night. You haven't looked at anything with this chapter. You really need to get in there and get working. This is a super fast way for you to communicate with your students. It's one of the best save you time tools in my math lab. So in your grade book, Go into your gradebook tools and click search and email by criteria. Okay, that's really good. <laughs> I'll yeah, be using yeah. that. Definitely. 
I mean, I'm really, really into communicating with my students. I'm really firm about that. I used to go through, you know, one student at a time, go through a batch of students, send emails. This is such a, such a nice feature. And again, if you forget later, you're not sure where that's from, those kinds of things are also covered in those videos. Just search an email by criteria. Sometimes even just scrolling through the videos and just going, oh, I, don't, I didn't know how to do that. Like, how can I link a homework to the companion test? Like, we talked about that today, like to do personalized homework. Um, you might scroll through here and go, oh, yeah, setting up grade weighting by percentage. I'd like to try that. So there's a lot of really pertinent topics and a lot of resources. The only other thing I wanted to cover with you then today would be if you don't have any further questions, we'll just do a quick discussion of the CEU project at the end of your guide. Do you have any okay. questions? No, you've answered everything. Thank you. Okay. So at the end of your guide, if you turn to the end of your participant's guide, you should see a CEU project. Well, it's not quite at the end. And I'm sorry, I had it open here and I accidentally closed it, so just give me a second. I'll open it up again. <clears throat> and I can't find it. There we go. Okay, so if we look at our participants guide and we go to our CU project, what you're going to do if you would like to have CU credit for today's workshop and then your self-study training, you can actually work through this particular project. So you would create a course using this particular book. You kind of create some, you know, pick some, create a homework, and you put some of these things in. Notice how we changed some of the point value just like we talked about today, create a test change some settings just so that you sort of get to walk through. You'll see that some of these are things that we talked about today, setting prerequisites, um, and then kind of answering some of these questions, you know, based on the things that you learned about today. You know, why is this important? How is this helpful? You know, understanding. So a lot of times what instructors will say is, I don't necessarily need a CEU, but this is a really nice way to be able to follow up on today's training. So if you do want to try out some of the things we learned about today and then have somebody take a look at it. What I usually say is that the benefit of doing the CEU project is getting that follow-up, that personal attention, kind of the mentoring. Like I'll be happy then to take a look at your course that you have and give you some feedback because here it says provide the course ID and I'll go in there, I'll take a look, I'll give you some feedback, make some suggestions, you know, kind of work with you to sort of help you as you begin to work through the new material that you learned today. Okay. Okay. So you can always email too if you have questions about that. It does look it does look worse than it really is. It looks long. What we did is made it very specific so that you know what you're doing. So for example, like today if you recall, we did an assignment where I had two sets of media. I had media and then I had a couple homework problems and I had another media. That's what they're showing you here. So you can set it up however you would like it, but you could take an existing course you have and make a copy of it and just try some of these things in. Here's one question that requires you to show work, and then we're saying, you know, make that worth 20 points, just again to make you kind of play around with different settings. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then again, just getting you to think about, you know, not only the how-to, but the application, because all of us teach different courses, we teach different schools, we have different perspectives or goals with our courses and, you know, different ideas of how we'd like our student workflow to look. So trying to get you to think about, like, what are some differences here? What are some resources or how might this be beneficial to my students? Okay. All right. I see where that could be real helpful. Um, typically they say that they'd like you to do that in the next, like, two or three weeks. If that's something you're interested in doing, but because of the timing, like with a new semester starting or something like that. If you need some additional time, you just need to send an email and say, you know, I really would like to do this project, but I'm going to probably get it to you, you know, about a week later. That's fine. Then we kind of know you're interested and we'll follow up with you as well. Um, again, the project's not mandatory, but it's a really nice way to kind of get some mentoring and just, uh, you know, so you don't feel like you're sort of out there alone making some mistakes and not quite sure where to go next. Okay. But definitely refer back to those videos and the training. Um, you know, and as you're working, read some of the other resources up here as well. You know, there's some, a lot you can connect with other users. We have a really nice um, community site, so you can read some articles and tips and tricks. There's a discussion board, so you don't feel sort of disconnected, especially, you know, I think you said early on, 
you know, working as an adjunct especially, um, it's easy to sort of feel disconnected sometimes from some of your professional peers. Okay, well, thank you all. This will be really helpful. You're welcome. Did you think about anything else that you have questions about? Doesn't need to be necessarily assignments if you've had a pressing concern about my math lab before we sign off for the day. No, you've, you've given me a lot to think about and you've, you've answered everything that, you know, I did have questions on. Okay. Well, great. Well, I really appreciate your um, time and attention today.